In just the last hour or so, Michael Burry from Scion Asset Management has filed his updated holdings so you can see what he's buying and selling. Michael Burry was portrayed by Christian Bale in The Big Short, where he made a boatload. And he actually, he's called several bets very well over time. A lot of things he didn't call right, in, in fairness, but he has made a lot of money for himself and his clients over arguably two of the past downturns, looking at the great financial crisis as well as the dot-com bubble. Uh, he was looking at stocks that were trading at you know well below liquidation value that performed very well. So it's his nature, I believe, to look for these sort of deep value plays. And so you look at his current holdings, and this is current as of December 31st, 2023, so it could have changed subsequently. But based on the filing required to file as of today, today's the deadline. Uh, you can see he actually had a very busy fourth quarter, a lot of different buying and selling. Uh, you know, when you're looking at these positions, the top two positions, it appears around 12% of his portfolio are Alibaba and JD.com. I think a lot of deep value investors are considering taking a speculative position on these companies, partly because they've gotten so absolutely trounced that, you know, you're, you're looking at very low multiples to free cash flow. You're talking about five to 10 times free cash flow for these types of businesses, which are, you know, dominant e-commerce players in China. Now there are, you know, other players that are growing faster, arguably taking market share, but they've gotten so beat up and they're starting to return so much capital to shareholders that I think you are seeing the deep value players like Michael Burry saying, hey, it is worthwhile to make it a larger percent of its portfolio, recognizing that this isn't going to be appropriate for everybody's journey. A lot of people don't like myself included, don't like to think about, well, what's the CP, you know, what's the CP, uh, you know, what's the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP going to do? Uh, you know, could they dramatically change the taxes or the framework in the in the near future that could lower your returns? I just don't like thinking about it. So it's not a core part of my portfolio. Uh, but you could see that Michael Burry is taking a speculative position saying, hey, this has gotten so beaten up and the values are, you know, so low that, you know, maybe there's hundreds of percent upside over time for these companies. And when you look at what he's, you know, during this quarter, he did buy a lot of different things, you know, not just JD and Alibaba, but you see HCA Healthcare, Oracle, Citigroup, CVS. I've done videos on Citigroup and CVS before. They're a little bit dated. I recently wrote a letter about CVS on how several other value investors were starting to buy it. Uh, that, that, letters exclusive to my subscribers at Unrival Investing. You know, Google is also buying Amazon. So some of these things are deep value. Some of these things I think are maybe more speculative in nature. Uh, you know, he, you see Block, he even bought, he bought Toast. I mean, this is big lots, which is supposed to, you know, it might be facing some sort of restructuring. So this, this might get completely wiped out, but there's a lot of different bets here. That's one of the things that you should, you know, note from this. And it is worth having some perspective on this, which is that Michael Burry, because of his prior successful bets, his net worth is estimated to be around $1.2 billion. So arguably, let's say between one and $2 billion, then tackle, you know, then throw on, you know, the fact that he runs Scion Asset Management. And that probably includes some clients that, you know, were loyal to him, that he says, hey, you can invest along with me. So really his assets under management, I presume are probably closer to, you know, a couple of billion dollars, realistically, in terms of the firepower that you're looking at, the liquidity that you're looking at with Michael Burry. And so when you see that his updated holdings for the fourth quarter include 25 different positions and $94 million investment versus, you know, a net worth that's arguably, you know, billion dollars or buying power assets under management that could be several billion dollars. It does reflect that while he's been buying a lot of things, it suggests he's actually lacking in conviction about this, you know, sort of saying maybe I'm going to participate with the rally that's going on by buying a bunch of, you know, individual positions that he thinks could tag along with the market that might not be, you know, extremely overvalued and, you know, buying these little things where he's like, oh, this is just so cheap. I have to buy it. But I, I look at this in the $95 million versus net worth versus. So it makes me think he's either not buying U.S. stocks uh, or another possibility is, you know, he's holding on to lots of cash. I personally keep my cash at Interactive Brokers, yielding currently over 4.8%. So I see the link below. And so I wonder if that's, you know, what he's actually doing, because yes, he bought a lot of new positions, but none of which looked 
particularly high conviction. So how can you possibly benefit from following along with Michael Burry? Because a lot of people feel sort of burned by, you know, he's saying one thing and then, you know, a week, couple of weeks later, he changes his mind. First of all, in full disclosure, this is not financial advice. Also, quick plug, recently on our exclusive Discord server, a member relayed to me that the unrivaled premium subscription has the best cost performance ratio. That's a direct quote. Uh, relative to alternative investing subscription services available. So if you're looking for compelling investment ideas, consider Unrivaled Investing, which includes a weekly letter and my personal portfolio updates in real time. So I also have educational materials as well, how to read financial statements, how to value a stock, which I designed, you know, based on my own experience working on Wall Street, sort of say, what would I have wanted to know when I first started out based on this experience? So the challenge with Michael Burry is that there is a lot of noise. You know, previously he said, you know, sell. He tweeted that. Then he said I was wrong to sell. And then he deletes his tweets. And honestly, this is just too much for most investors to process. You know, there's there's just a lot of activity. And, you know, he might buy in one quarter. And then the next quarter, you know, halfway through, he, when, when you see it, he's already selling out of it. And this is the activity from the third quarter where you can see he blew out of most of these positions, some of which he actually bought back, you know, uh, shortly later. So maybe that was some tax loss selling like MGM Resorts. Um, so it's, it's unclear. Uh, but but either way, you're talking about an investor that is very active and it makes it harder for investors to benefit. So how can you benefit by potentially looking at Michael Burry's holdings? Well, one is to scour through all of his holdings, what's he buying, and then run it through another filter. I personally run it through AI ticker chat using their AI predict feature to sort of say, hey, does the math check out on this holding that might warrant, let's say 100, 200% plus upside, in which case it might be worth you know, doing further review. In HCA Healthcare, that was one of the stocks he bought. And using artificial intelligence, it's saying, hey, based on the transcripts, based on their latest results, here's a framework for thinking about it. And this is a starting point for me. So that way I can quickly go through these different holdings and say, okay, maybe this is the one I want to dive into. You know, and this is one that I don't, you know, I did the same thing for Oracle and it didn't look as compelling. Whereas this, this is, you know, looks a lot cheaper trading around teens type earnings, the largest healthcare or lar largest hospital provider, I believe in the United States or one of the largest. So I, I don't think it's going anywhere. It does have some debt, but a lot of free cash flow as well. I think also investors that want to sort of leverage the knowledge of others, is better suited to look at investors with lower turnover. For example, Pat Dorsey running De Dorsey Asset Management. I believe he used to run Morningstar's research program. He also wrote a book. I, I don't have it over my shoulder, but it's part of the series, the little book series. I think it's called Little Book uh, That Builds Wealth. And Pat Dorsey wrote that book. And it was a framework that actually, I, I remember reading that book and reading all of Warren Buffett's letters and thinking, wow, he did a really great job summarizing the key uh, points that Buffett makes in across dozens of letters uh, in terms of what are the types of competitive advantages that you could look for. And so that's that's a good book if, if you want to think about competitive advantages, a little book that builds wealth by Pat Dorsey. And so I like looking at this one because it's more concentrated portfolio. It's a much larger portfolio, around $800 million, much lower turnover. And so occasionally there's only, you know, like in the in the quarter, there was only one new buy. And so that's like, OK, I want to learn more about Danaher. This is a company with a long track record, and it's gone through many different transformations over time. Now it's mostly, I believe, a, a, a lab and, you know, science equipment type of business. Um, but historically, this is a business that has done very well. Uh, and it's interesting because not only is Pat Dorsey buying Danaher, but I look at Michael Burry and two of his positions that he bought were also companies and so here it is. You can see the summary from AI ticker chat that are tied to the same type of scientific instruments, analytical and diagnostic solutions type of businesses. So it makes me wonder if there's a broader thesis between Danaher, Brucker, Mettler, Toledo that might suggest that there's, you know, that maybe they all sold off and there's an opportunity as they rebound. It's something that I want to learn more about. And this I I think this is the key lesson for investors is that you can't uh, borrow the conviction that Michael Burry has. You can borrow an idea, but you can't borrow that the conviction that he has, you know, when he buys or sells something. So that conviction is going to need to come from you. And so you're going to have to, 
you know, review these ideas if you're interested, uh, or you can go to, you know, someone like me at unrivalinvesting.com and you can, you know, I will go through these and I'll call out what I think is interesting and I'll do a weekly letter. Um, and so, or I'll do a, you know, monthly update with a video that goes over some, some of the ideas I find interesting. And so, you know, you, you can't borrow that like, oh, well, this is the reason why he bought it. And so you need to do your own steps to say, okay, this is, even if he sells in the future, I'm still going to own it for these reasons. I mean, I personally benefited greatly from, you know, seeing that he bought McKesson, you know, over a year ago and then I bought it myself and went up over 100%. And, you know, even though he sold out of it, I still held because I was like, okay, I've built my own conviction. And I think generally there's a couple of ways that you can build conviction in positions, one of which is by learning about the business. But another key aspect, and this is sort of the, my, my, my dad likes to talk about being risk averse. And so, so sometimes he talks about, you know, I, he likes to wear a belt and suspenders. He, he doesn't actually, but a belt and suspenders approach to life. And uh, it, it's, you know, that's, that's one way of framing it. Another way of framing it, uh, recently there was a uh, John Malone interview and he said uh, he, he's a hedger and he never puts both on the table, uh, if, if you know what I mean. And, uh, you know, so, that, you know, this this idea that being risk adverse means, OK, how do you ensure that you don't blow up? And, you know, how do you how do you ensure that the downside is mitigated? And so I think with Michael Burry, oftentimes it's looking at these things with lots of free cash flow. But that's that's only one aspect to it. The part that that I personally prefer versus the, let's say, buying at a low multiple to free cash flow, which is an approach, but can lead to higher turnover. My personal approach is I'm not looking for all this hyperactivity. I want to find things that I can sit and hold for years and possibly decades into the future. And so for for me, that means the, the belt and suspenders is going to need to come from some sort of alignment with management. Now, there's two ways you can get that with from, from management, one of which is management either owns a lot of stock. And if management owns a lot of stock, it's their life's work. It's their mission to grow this business. This is their canvas and they're painting on it and they're saying, I can't wait for this business to, you know, I'm so excited to keep building. I'm tap dancing to work. That's one way. You're a lot less likely to have a blow up risk when someone's truly passionate about what they're building. So that's, that's one perspective. The other perspective is sometimes a business has been around so long, you can no longer get those founders. And that's the example with McKesson is you didn't have a founder in it. But the alternative path is that you have management, that you have such a high degree of confidence that they'll be able to return the free cash flow to you as a shareholder. And maybe they make that very clear saying, hey, we're not going to go after some large acquisitions. We're not going to overpay. And, you know, because the stock trades, it's such a low multiple to free cash flow. We're aware of it and we're going to return it to you. So then it turns into really a financial engineering type of problem. We're going, OK, I may not have super high confidence in management, but I also don't think they're going to screw me over because they've made it clear this is the, the path for shareholder returns. And it's going to come through maybe not a lot of growth, but that cash going to me as a shareholder each year, either through buybacks or through dividends. And so I think those that's broadly how I'm personally looking, you know, at this is I, I look at the holdings and then say, OK, how do I get comfortable? You know, how do I build my own conviction on some of these? And most of the time it's not. Most of the time I say I, I can't do it because you don't have the founder or you don't have management that clearly articulates, hey, here's the free cash flow that's going to go to you as a shareholder. Case in point, one of his top holdings is CVS. And keep in mind, it, it, these are all relatively small. I personally view like I bet he could 10x one of those positions easily. And so I, I think these are a bunch of small bets that he's placed sort of saying, OK, I think the market keeps rising. He probably has a large cash position and, you know, he, he doesn't have super high conviction, but he's he's buying a lot of things. And it's you're better off looking for those investors that have lower turnover, more concentrated portfolio. Um, but with it, but going back to the case of CBS, that's a company trading at a low multiple to free cash flow, I believe around 10 times free cash flow. 
Uh, and the challenge is management has historically squandered that free cash flow on some acquisitions where you go, really? Like you're, you're paying this much for that? And so the, the, that's part of the reason why it trades at that discount. So if you have confidence that management can no longer or will no longer make those acquisitions, then you know you might say, oh, okay, it's it's worth buying. Um, but that's that. those are the different perspectives to consider. I hope this video talking about Michael Burry's latest investment update also more broadly how you might benefit from it which is not just you know looking at the ideas and saying oh i gotta buy and sell it is it's it's really sort of like a cheat sheet of potential ideas where you go okay maybe this is something that aligns with my own personal journey and it's appropriate for you to recognize that everyone has their own type of journey. Michael Burry's done very well. He's worth over a billion dollars and he's more comfortable with this hyperactivity. I'm personally, you know, much more comfortable with lower turnover, just trying to find management that I love and trying to pay a fair price and watch it grow each year. You know, I call out my holdings once again at unravelinvesting.com. I hope this video has been helpful for you. Please make point of hitting that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button. Thanks so much for tuning in.